Good morning, and welcome to this Conservation Applied Research and Development, or CARD, webinar, which is going to report on key findings and the possibilities to completely displace central air conditioning with dual fuel heat pumps in residential buildings. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items before we start. All attendees will be in listen-only mode today. We will answer all questions at the end of the presentation, but as questions occur to you, please type them into the Q&A box and send them to all panelists. The Q&A box can be opened by clicking the ellipse in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We'll do our best to answer all questions within the time allocated, but if we don't get to some for some reason, we will answer them after the webinar and post them with the webinar recording. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the department's website in a few weeks. The slide set from the webinar will also be available on the website, but if you need it sooner, email me directly and I'll send it to you. Finally, if you would like to use closed captions on this webinar, click the CC bubble in the lower left part of your screen. I'm Mary Sue Lobenstein and I'm the Research Planning um, Director at the Minnesota Department of Commerce, Division of Energy Resources. And in that role, I identify and analyze gaps within utility um, conservation improvement programs and coordinate and plan research to fill those gaps. The CARD program is a major tool of that work. With me today is Adam Zoet, and Adam is an Energy Planning Director at the Department of Commerce where he specializes in the regulation of electric and gas utility energy efficiency programs. He was a project manager on the research that's the subject of today's webinar, and he'll be moderating the Q&A portion of the presentation today. Now I'd like to introduce the project team, which consisted of Josh Quinnell, Emily McPherson, Renal Tadawi, and Tadima Emanicki, from, all from the Center for Energy and Environment. Josh is a senior research scientist at CE with 13 years research experience in building science. Josh is currently working on heat pumps, building envelopes, and the impacts of electrification on the grid. He was the primary investigator on the research that is being presented today. Emily has been working on heat pump programs and deployment for the past 12 years and specializes in market transformation program work. Renal is a research analyst at CEE, where he collects, processes, and analyzes data relating to building energy systems and efficiency. His current projects include topics in heat pumps and beneficial electrification. Tadinma is an energy analyst at CEE and analyzes data relating to residential energy efficiency technologies, including heat pump systems, and um, she contributed to the market research and analysis sections of this presentation today. Welcome to all of you, and we really look forward to the webinar. Just for some context, this webinar is one in an ongoing series designed to summarize results from research projects that are funded by the Minnesota Applied Research and Development Fund, which was established in the Next Generation Energy Act of 2007. The purpose of this fund is to help Minnesota utilities achieve their energy saving goal. About 2.6 million is set aside annually for the CARD program, which awards research grants and a competitive request for proposal process. Results from CARD projects provide utilities with data to enhance energy efficiency program designs within their conservation improvement pro program pro portfolios. As you can see by the pie chart, CARD projects funded to date have been in all building sectors, as well as some that cross multiple sectors. The subject of today's webinar is the residential sector, and we'll discuss whether and how we could leverage familiarity with high efficiency cooling to expand market opportunities for air source heat pump systems in Minnesota. Now I'll turn it over to Josh to kick off today's presentation. Uh, thank you, Mary Sue. Uh, so it's the end of AC as we know it, and I feel fine. That's either a reference to an REM song or uh, prepping culture. Uh, I'll leave that up to you. Um, actually, we should be more than fine about it. We should feel good, maybe even excited about it. Um, if you're already there in that space, I know a lot of you are, um, that's great. Um, I hope 
If you're not there, some of our findings can help persuade you. And if they don't, I hope we can learn more about why after the talk. Um, so we're talking about heat pumps as cooling measures for ACs today. Uh, before um, I get going, I do want to call out that there is a lot of work in this space ongoing all over the country under lots of different programs. Um, while our work is specific to Minnesota, um, it is probably applicable to other climate zones, six and seven areas, as well as maybe even further south. Um, and I just want to mention that this is just our work today is just one piece of this puzzle. Uh, and it's specifically call out a lot of the other work that has been coming out recently. Um, so NREL has been uh, recently released at the end of last year, a national topology study for decarbonizing U.S. buildings. I know they have a lot of ongoing work, probably with a lot of soon to be released materials. Lawrence Berkeley Lab uh, released a study earlier this year on carbon and energy cost impacts of electrification of space heating in uh, with heat pumps in the U.S. with climate specific results. Um, RAP report just dropped this month um, and they very explicitly made the case for swapping air conditioners for heat pumps, uh, very similar to what we're proposing today. And then just last week, AC Tripoli dropped a report on the analysis of electric and gas decarbonization options for homes, really emphasizing the role of dual fuel opportunities in the Minnesota climate. So heat pumps are really complicated. They're very different than a lot of prior efficiency work. And so I think this entire body of research is really relevant. Uh, that said, our focus here today is very exclusively, again, on heat pumps as cooling measures in Minnesota. So very quickly, um, I'll get with an, uh, start with an induction, get us going here, um, and then we'll dive into the two major aspects of our project today, um, our market research work followed uh, on, the, on the central air conditioning market, and then followed by some of our technical modeling um, on the energy and cost savings of heat pumps for this application. And then we'll jump into our conclusions and hopefully leave a lot of time uh, for your questions. So the big picture, let's dial in from the top to where we are at right now with this project. Space heating is the biggest end use in Minnesota cold climate homes by a factor of 10 over other measures. Um, decarbonization of this space heating load via electrification using uh, renewable electricity is among the best climate mitigation options we have for our buildings. Um, on top of that, air source heat pumps are an incredible energy efficiency opportunity. We're talking up to 600% better than standard gas furnaces. Um, but all electric heat pump installations um, to date are prohibitively expensive on upfront costs. And also they cost a lot more to operate than natural gas furnaces. So maybe we back off that a little bit and say, well, let's start smaller. Um, air source heat pumps, it turns out, are also a cooling measure. They generally cool better than code minimum central air conditioners. So we asked the question, um, can we advance the heat pump market by installing heat pumps for cooling savings? And then maybe beyond that, how close can we get to our, decarbon our residential space heating decarbonization goals if we pursue air source heat pumps as central air conditioning system replacements? So let's talk about our market really quick. Um, those of you who are attending are hopefully mostly from Minnesota. We're a very cold climate, everybody knows this, um, but we also have extreme summer conditions. Uh, in fact, as a state, we peak, uh, we get peak electricity demand in the summertime because of those peak loads. Um, even so, we have a small cooling load. We have extreme days, but most of our cooling degree days are mild. This makes it really challenging to achieve uh, cost-effective cooling savings. Um, it also probably highlights that there is maybe a need for a creative strategy to capture these cooling savings in our current climate. Um, in addition, uh, significant portions of our housing stock are eligible for air source heat pump as AC replacements. Um, there's already a clear financial benefit for using air source heat pumps if you've got electric resistance or are propane heated. The cost savings are there today and they're, they're very high. Uh, so this report focuses on homes with natural gas furnaces, um, which is the majority of Minnesota housing stock. About 1.2 million homes have ducted natural gas furnaces in the state, 60 to 70% of the total um, uh, market. And that's what we're really targeting with this work today. So let's be very explicit about what we're talking about. Um, we are talking about centrally ducted systems. Uh, we're not talking about mini splits, multi splits, or mini ducted systems. We're looking specifically at dual fuel or hybrid heat applications where heat pumps are integrated with natural gas heating systems. We are not looking at all electric heat pumps or we are, and we are not looking at propane backed up systems. We are looking at air source heat pumps that are sized for the cooling load. Um, they are sized to replace air conditioners. We're not looking at heat pumps that are sized for Minnesota heating loads. 
And this study considers all types of heat pumps, including single speed systems, uh, variable speed systems, as well as cold climate systems. Uh, and we're considering heat pumps that are both interoperable or non interoperable with existing furnaces. Uh, this basically means um, we're considering heat pumps that require all components to be by one manufacturer because um, they kind of speak a proprietary language, but we're also considering systems that are uh, have simple analog communications so you can mix and match components um, depending on the circumstances of the installation. So from that, I'd like to talk about some of our key research questions that we're going to address today. Um, first, what are the market barriers and opportunities for air source heat pump technology as specifically as a central air conditioning replacement? Uh, and secondly, what are the sensitivities we have governing the energy and cost savings potential of these systems in this application? And lastly, what are the promising avenues to customer to finding customer cost and energy savings in this space? Um, to get at our first question, uh, let me hand it off to my colleague, Emily, uh, to talk about our market work. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> so this project, as Josh mentioned, included both a technical analysis portion and a market research portion of the work so that we could understand the technology potential and the market opportunities with barriers and, and you know, how we could help reveal a path forward for this application type. So I'm going to start by discussing some of the key market research findings that were revealed through this project. So we conducted these market surveys to understand the perceptions, the barriers and opportunities with a customer audience, as well as supply chain. So contractors, distributors and manufacturers for this heat pump application type specifically. We performed an online survey for homeowners, and then we did in-depth interviews with installers, distributors, and manufacturers. We partnered with Lead Research, who created and administered the customer survey portion. And I'm going to focus on these results today in the webinar. And I'm also going to include some high-level takeaways from the other survey audience types. The full detail will be provided in the report. It's important to note that in the customer survey, we only interviewed homeowners with natural gas furnaces and air conditioners. Within that group, we also did some segmentation to show outcomes for homeowners who recently purchased AC, and then also those who intended to, intended to purchase AC in the future. And those complete details will be included in the final report. So I'm gonna start by sharing some of the high level key takeaways from the customer survey, and then I'll dive into some details. So there are six main points that we really pulled from this research. And the first point is that what we learned is most homeowners were happy with their existing systems, but they did show a strong interest in upgrading to new and better technology, to lowering their operational costs and to lessening environmental impact. Next, most customers replaced on failure or at the point of system malfunction. Customers indicated that they wanted to make choices carefully and weigh out multiple options, but they may not have had time to do so during the urgency of emergency replacement. The third point is that customers want to review and consider multiple options at the point of replacement, but most of the recent purchasers won't, weren't presented with those options. Additionally, customers were willing to pay more upfront and a six year payback was reported as very attractive. The majority of customers want to replace their AC and furnace together, but there is a smaller segment of customers who do prefer to replace their AC only. And then lastly, awareness of the technology was low to moderate and education was needed for customers. So now I'm gonna dig into some of the more detailed findings. The first finding I wanna highlight is some segmentation that we did with recent purchasers to understand what they valued most when purchasing new central AC equipment. The results showed that cost-driven factors really rose to the top for these customers with cooling performance, equipment cost, and operating costs being the most highly ranked. We also wanted to understand trends about replacing just the AC only versus the frequency in which full furnace and AC replacements were occurring. So we asked recent AC purchasers <clears throat> to reveal this trend. What we found is that most customers replace their furnace and AC at the same time with a smaller segment replacing the AC only. 
there was a correlation between income level and full system replacement. Homeowners with higher income levels were more likely to choose the full system replacement option. In addition, we wanted to understand customer willingness to spend higher amounts up front to reduce energy costs. So in this question, we asked customers to indicate how likely they were to spend an additional $500, $1,000, or over $1,000 to reduce their energy costs ongoing. And as you can see in this chart, nearly half of customers are likely to spend up to $500 more on first cost to reduce ongoing energy costs. And then about a quarter of customers were likely to spend up to $1,000 or more to reduce their energy costs. And the last detailed point I'm going to make is related to customer awareness levels. So when we surveyed customers, awareness of heat pump technology was low to moderate. Then in the survey, we provided educational materials to educate survey participants <clears throat> on heat pump technology and benefits and, how, and asked how likely they would be to consider heat pump technology as an alternative to their air conditioning systems. What we found is that over half of the customers were likely to consider heat pumps as an alternative to air conditioners. Then we asked them what they would need to make a decision. Responses were focused on really wanting more information about the technology, understanding how it works and how it works in our climate, and then also having experience with other homeowners who have the technology. So sort of a word of mouth sentiment is what we heard from customers. And then the last thing I'm gonna talk about is um, some of the key takeaways from the supply chain in-depth interviews that we performed. I'm just gonna highlight a few of these key, key takeaways because we have a lot of information to cover today, but you can find the full results in the report. So with the contractor interviews, contractors reported that demand for heat pumps in air conditioning replacement is low as of today. Customers need to know more about the technology and rebates are a key success factor for this type of product. The contractors did report a sense that air source heat pump business may increase in the future. Then what we heard from distributors is that most heat pump sales are occurring in the mini split category and are not sold for this AC replacement application type. They see demand for the technology, but from the efficiency industry and not actually from customers. They believe that contractors are receptive to the technology. We also heard a sense that a fraction of customers always select the top option presented and that heat pumps could be offered as a premium product in AC replacement scenario. And then from the manufacturer audience, what we heard was that global trends of markets transitioning from fossil fuels to heat pumps are, are occurring. And manufacturers agree that heat pump as AC replacement will be a useful step in this transition. And so that concludes the customer research findings and the key takeaways. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Renal to talk about the technical research. Thanks, Emily. So I'll be talking about the technical research, uh, firstly, the methodology, and then we'll go into the results themselves. So for this analysis, we've used an hourly energy model. It mimics a year's HVAC energy for a typical older building, similar to those built in Minneapolis in the 1950s. Uh, this home has an existing natural gas furnace and has a failing central air conditioner that needs replacement. The characteristics of this building, uh, it's important to note, are held constant across all scenarios. Our energy simulations are then iterated across several variables, as you see here. These variables encompass several different factors that may impact the customer's replacement of their existing central air conditioner. This includes the type of air, uh, air source heat pump, their existing baseline furnace, the gas and electric rates, including potential dual fuel rates that are available to them, the type of replacement, either air conditioner only or what we're calling full replacement, which is the air conditioner and the furnace, um, the switchover temperature, which is the temperature at which the air source heat pump is disabled and relies completely on the baseline furnace for heating, and the location of the home in the state. The image on the right shows how we've divided the state into four quadrants for that location. Each quadrant exemplifies a distinct climate type and is represented by a single location in each quadrant. 
The location of the home, it's important to note, influences only the weather data and doesn't govern any non-energy aspects, including rates. And combined, these factors result in over 1.3 million scenarios that we've run. So first, let's go into the heat pumps themselves. Uh, these span performance potential across varying price points from the lowest to the highest tier. And we've broadly categorized them into four archetypes, as you can see in this table. The single speed air source heat pump represents an entry level system that's most like a code minimum central air conditioner. This is unable to modulate capacity and displays a large capacity and efficiency loss at colder outdoor air temperatures, as you can see in the plots below. The entry level variable speed unit has a high efficiency potential at milder temperatures, but it doesn't re return that capacity very well in colder conditions. The average variable speed unit maintains high COP across its performance window, but it isn't available below a three ton capacity, so it's got a larger rate of capacity than the others. And finally, we have the highest tier cold climate air source heat pump, which has a slightly lower SEER rating, in fact, and average COP than the other variable speed units. But as you can see in the plots in teal, uh, it retains this capacity very well and operates down to peak winter conditions. Uh, next, let's go through a few of the other variables of interest. Uh, I think we need the next slide. Uh, firstly, let's talk about the baseline furnace and fan combination, which determines the gas backup efficiency, fan efficiency in watts per CFM, and fan operating behavior. Uh, then we have the gas and electric rates that are iterated to be inclusive of potential present and future rate scenarios. And as I had mentioned before, they are inclusive of potential dual fuel lower electric rates that could apply to the heat pump system. Then as we have learned from our market research, consumers often replace both the air conditioner and the furnace simultaneously. And to capture this, we look at two replacement types. CAC only, as you would expect, is just the replacement of the existing air conditioner, while full replacement is both the CAC and the furnace and blower combination to improve furnace and fan efficiency, improving both cooling and heating energy consumption. The switchover temperature is set by the contractor and homeowner and is the temperature at which the air source heat pump switches to the gas backup. It's varied between negative 15 and 65 Fahrenheit, but there is a point above negative 15 Fahrenheit at which the heat pump will be incapable of providing the load at the specified rated capacity. This is what we're calling the capacity switchover. And um, this applies in all cases, regardless of whether the switchover that we um, select is below or closer to negative 15. Next, let's talk about incremental costs. Um, these are currently mired in significant uncertainty due to several factors external to the equipment itself. To account for this, we've approached incremental cost estimates from two different directions. Firstly, we estimate incremental costs based on the wholesale price of equipment, plus an additional 40% markup and additional adjustments to account for installation complexity in full replacement and variable speed scenarios. Uh, then we also attempt to, uh, I, I think we need the previous slide, I'm sorry. Um, then we also attempt to determine incremental costs using average contractor bids. These values are derived from over 50 bids from 2022 for two to three ton air source heat pumps that we believe to be similar to each of these archetypes in the table. Uh, I think a major takeaway here is that based on wholesale costs, the single speed air source heat pump comes in at just a $700 premium above the CAC alternative, or just $1,000 for a full replacement, and an entry level variable speed system may be about two to $3,000. Intuitively, we would expect that air source heat pumps with higher capacities, like the average variable speed heat pump, would come at a cost premium, but the current variation between bids for similar equipment eliminates that relationship, as any capacity-based effects are eclipsed by other influences on quoted costs. Uh, next, let's touch on rebates just briefly. Um, this is a table of heat pump and AC rebates available for Minnesota IOUs as of August 2022. Uh, as you can see, Minnesota Power and Ottertail Power are offering rebates that are on the magnitude of low-end incremental costs that we saw in the previous slide. And for some perspective, we also have the current rebate XL is offering for high-efficiency cooling, which is also in the ballpark of our lowest incremental cost. Existing rebates can make a huge dent or outright eliminate incremental costs for air source heat pumps, 
especially for our lower price point units. And uh, we also note that these rebates are of similar range to what customers said they would pay for lowering their energy bills. And next, let's introduce some of the results that we have from this work, starting with cooling savings. Uh, so this, these are the cooling savings for specifically the single speed air source heat pump, which is our lower tier unit. Uh, we're comparing this on the right side uh, to several CAC and fan type combinations. And in this plot, the PSC fans are the less efficient option compared to the ECM blowers. Depending on the baseline and the replacement type, this unit can yield between zero kilowatt hours and nearly 400 kilowatt hours in cooling savings annually. As could be expected, comparing the CR14 uh, single speed heat pump to lower efficiency baselines produces a larger potential savings just due to the pure efficiency improvement. And while savings compared to code minimum CACs are meager, there is a large savings potential compared to older, less efficient units, as you can see. Additionally, in full replacement scenarios pictured in blue, uh, we can add significant savings in the cooling season to improve fan efficiency. By right-sizing these units, not pictured in the chart, all air source heat pumps can produce increased cooling comfort compared to CAC alternatives. In fact, that's why zero savings show up in that one scenario, and our air source heat pump strategy here reflects the inherent comfort benefit of right-sizing, but savings are reduced. Next, we have the same analysis, but for the variable speed heat pump, I believe this is the average variable speed unit. Um, this is a CR20 unit, so right off the bat, you can see that savings are much higher in all scenarios, thanks to the higher cooling efficiency of this heat pump, with savings ranging from around 200 kilowatt hours to 700 kilowatt hours, depending on the baseline that you're comparing it to and the type of replacement. For variable speed and lower capacity units, the fan efficiency becomes a more significant factor in energy savings, as when the heat pump modulates capacity down to match load, it results in longer run times in general. And longer run times could incur energy penalties with inefficient fans. So replacing the fan as well as the um, furnace alongside the central air conditioner allows us to unlock additional energy savings in full replacement. Uh, next, let's move on to heating savings. So this table shows the capacity switchover for each heat pump archetype, along with the potential heating load that can be met with electric heating above that switchover. Nearly all air source heat pumps can meet the majority of this home's annual heating load, with the single speed unit close behind at 47%. This is a key finding we feel that we find quite surprising, as it shows sizing these units for cooling rather than heating can still yield the majority of emissions and energy savings of full, fully electrifying this heating system. Even the single speed base level unit size for cooling can offer sizable energy savings in the heating season, getting us nearly halfway there. Another key finding not shown in this table is that regardless of heat pump, furnace replacements can provide a lot of additional energy savings in these scenarios with an additional 40 to 150 therms in heating savings attributed to increased efficiency below the switchover temperature and improve fan efficiency throughout the heating season. While the results shown here are only for Minneapolis, there is only a 20% difference to the other three locations, and those results are displayed in our full report. So we've seen that even the simplest of air source heat pumps can be capable of significant energy savings in both heating and cooling, but we're missing a key consideration in customer costs. Let me hand off to Josh Quinnell to discuss how energy improvements can translate to consumer energy cost savings as well. Take it away, Josh. Thank you, Renal. Yeah, so what about cost effectiveness? Um, here we are interested in cost effectiveness from the customer perspective. Do their operational cost savings pay for what are higher upfront incremental costs of air source heat pumps? Um, recall that our incremental costs on the low end were $700 ish for a single speed air source heat pump and two to three thousand dollars for the entry level variable speed systems whether there was a furnace um, attached to it or not the question is can we get the savings to pay off these equipment costs um well it's my favorite answer a lot of engineers love this answer um the answer is it depends <laughs> um we've run a lot of scenarios in this study um and i guess the headline is that all combinations of location uh, baseline equipment air source heat pump type and replacement type have cost-effective outcomes. 
Um, but what really matters most are the actual gas and electric rates. Uh, cost effectiveness exhibits extreme sensitivity to utility rates. Uh, and this is frankly a big barrier because there's rate volatility, there's special rate adders, and there's general uncertainty over the entire lifetime of the equipment about what the rates will actually be. And I think to date, a lot of work on the costs of air source heat pumps in our climate um, have made it really difficult to appreciate this complexity. So that's what I hope we can offer here, um, is we studied a lot of different rates um, to try to give us a better understanding of, of what the environment looks like. And I want to use three scenarios to kind of highlight the range of outcomes we observed. Um, they reflect, in part, our technical modeling, which was uh, influenced by um, what we learned by surveying customers on the supply chain. So our first scenario, we have a newish furnace. Let's say it's a 90% condensing furnace. It has a nice ECM fan in it. It's maybe six or eight years old. Um, the CAC has failed, the air conditioner has failed, but the furnace isn't old enough for the consumer um, such that they don't want to invest in the replacement right now. So we'll compare the entry level air source heat pump, uh, single speed entry level air source heat pump to this kind of code minimum uh, alternative cooling system. Scenario two, uh, we have an older furnace. Let's say it's an 80% efficiency furnace. It has an older PSC blower, so less efficient. Um, this furnace is beyond end of life or very near end of life. Uh, it was probably installed at the same time of the air conditioner that's failed. So this customer is eager to replace it, um, even though the furnace hasn't failed and may have some life left in it. Um, here we're going to replace the whole system uh, with an entry level variable speed system and a new furnace that has a multi speed ECM fan. Um, scenario three is the same as scenario two. Um, they have an older furnace, they're looking to replace it when they replace their air conditioner. In this case, though, this customer has the option to switch to a dual fuel electric rate. Uh, in this case, we picked an electric rate of seven cents a kilowatt hour. So they make the same equipment swap out, but they get access to a different race, rate environment with that air source heat pump as a potential heating system. So let's check out these scenarios. Um, so these plots have a lot on them, so I'm going to go really slow to um, remember, this, this is scenario one. We are going to just replace the AC because we've got a 90% condensing furnace that still has a lot of life left in it. So there's two plots up here. Uh, these are contour plots. On the left, um, we show switchover temperature. On the right, we show cost savings, and both vary with different gas and electric rates. On uh, both plots, I have gas on the x-axis. I go from 50 cents a therm to very expensive gas at 160 per therm. And then on the y-axis, I have uh, cheap electricity at nine cents a kilowatt hour to moderately expensive electricity at 20 cents a kilowatt hour. So switch over temperature on the left. There's a huge rate environment here, but let's just focus in on the red circle. This is pretty much encapsulates a lot of current rate environments throughout the state um, based on what we've looked into to date. Um, if I look on switch over temperature on the left, um, we can see that this region is basically all yellow. Uh, what this is telling us is that for these rate combinations, gas and electric rate combinations, it makes sense to use this machine basically in cooling only. Um, in other words, we use it for cooling and then we switch over at 60 degrees, so it only operates a very small amount. Um, if we go outside that red circle and look at all that purple area, uh, we can see that basically at expensive gas rates or ch and cheap electric rates, suddenly we go from yellow to purple, implying that we now run this single speed heat pump all the way to 25 degrees, which is this capacity switchover. We run it as much as possible. And if you look in between yellow and purple, there's there's only really 35 and all the switchovers between 25 and 60 are really hidden. This just reflects the really strong rate sensitivity here. We don't have much flexibility in how we operate the system. We're either running it all out or we're running it only in cooling to try to maximize our cost savings here. And the consequences of that are on the right. They're frankly not that interesting. You can see that in the current rate environment, we probably would operate these systems mainly in cooling only, and we would be looking at 25 to $35 a year in savings. But there's some other things we could look at too. Um, so if we just follow the, tr the trend lines here, so they're, they're, they're the contour lines, they go up diagonally. Um, what this shows is that if gas and electric rates are linked and they go up together, it doesn't really affect the cost effectiveness. In order for the cost effectiveness to change here, the, the cost savings from the air source heat pumps, we really need those rates to move independently. We need electric rates to go up with gas rates constant or vice versa. And now is a good time to mention that this is, um, all these results we're presenting from a cost perspective are very conservative. Um, it shows that we can run these systems with annual cost savings while improving comfort. 
Um, alternatively, if the baseline is a right-sized air conditioner, we save about $50 or more per year. Um, but we do want to capitalize on what we learned from the, the market work, um, which is that air source heat pumps, right-sized air source heat pumps can provide cooling savings even when they're configured for comfort instead of maximizing um, energy savings. Um, you can't get much more with this, um, but you could alternatively use some of that flexibility to maybe run the heat pump more. Um, but there's, there's, I think the point of the single speed system is we can get kind of the bare minimum of savings, but we lose a lot of flexibility that we think about when we consider uh, heat pumps as a, as a overall measure. So let's talk about scenario two. Scenario two looks a lot more interesting right off the bat. We've got a lot more colors everywhere. Um, recall scenario two is we have an older furnace. We're willing to replace that alongside our, air, our failed air conditioner. We're going to use an entry level variable speed heat pump. This heat pump now has an inverter. And right off the bat, that inverter makes things a lot more interesting. Uh, so these are the same plots again. I have switch over temperature on the left. I have cost savings on the right. Um, the first thing again to notice is that if we just look in this red circle around current rates, we have a lot more variability in switch over temperature as a function of rates. In other words, our heat pump is much more flexible in where it can operate in response to the rate environment. You can see that at current rates, we could uh, optimize this thing for cost savings, running it between 60 degrees and cooling only all the way down to 35 degrees to maximize uh, uh, cost savings to the customer. Now, it's still very sensitive to rates, but we do get this um, additional flexibility. It gives us more we can do with the system compared to the single speed heat pump, which means that in practice, we can get um, more energy emission savings and there's more of a relationship between um, whether we're preferring cost savings or whether we're preferring environmental savings. If you look at the consequences of this in the right side chart, you see, again, a different kind of picture than we saw before. Um, we essentially get a lot, a lot higher cost savings associated with this higher performance equipment. Um, in these current rates, we're kind of looking at somewhere around 200 to $250 a year, um, which again is an uh, order of magnitude more than before. Um, and I want to remind you that we think these results here are pretty conservative. Um, and remind you again that there's a, a, a big comfort benefit of this system too, since it can run at low speed um, for much uh, better humidity control compared to the uh, code minimum air conditioner. And then consequently, $250 of savings um, per year is more than sufficient to make this system cost effective over its lifetime um, compared to the low end of our estimate for incremental costs in this system. So what about the last scenario? Um, we recall scenario three was the same as scenario two, so the same equipment swap out. The difference here is that we have access to a special um, dual fuel heating rate, um, which is seven cents a kilowatt hour. And there is a difference in the plots. They're both switch over temperature on the left and cost savings on the right. But you'll notice the Y axis now is the baseline electric rate. This is the electric rate to the customer. Uh, if they were to keep their uh, central air conditioner alternative, but with the heat pump, they have access to the dual fuel rate. So the first thing we notice is that these um, these contour lines are now vertical. It's because with the uh, with the heat pump, the 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 electric electric rate is fixed, so the switch over temperature no longer depends on on the electric rate. It just depends on the gas rate. And here we see uh, really different outcomes. And at a dollar a therm, we can run this machine down to its capacity switch over. We can essentially claim as much savings as possible from it. And then even at around 80 cents a therm, we can still run this thing down to um, below 30 degrees. And we can see the translation to customer cost savings on the right. Um, again, another boost, about a doubling of cost savings. Here, we're, we're looking now at about $350 to $500 a year in cost savings. What this means in practice is that we can now pay back this system even at the high end of incremental costs that we currently see in the market. And again, don't forget, this is conservative. This, um, this is also a much better machine uh, that will provide comfort and noise benefits compared to code minimum. This is a really terrific result, to be frank. So another reminder, we have to respect the rate sensitivity here. You know, these results all depend on the rate, the current rate environment and the future rate environment. And we've got a lot of outcomes. Um, they essentially range from cost neutral, again, with comfort, future flexibility benefits, a little bit conservative on the weather assumptions, to highly cost effective even with even more comfort and future flexibility benefits. So where does this bring us? Uh, well, I think we're in a really good spot for moving air source heat pumps, um, moving toward air source heat pumps over 
cooling systems in Minnesota single family homes. I want to reiterate why. <laughs> Again, um, so existing heat pump products, those on the market or soon to be on the market today, offer a very broad range of system types and designs. Uh, they can be used to cater to a variety of customer needs. Um, one of the challenges, however, is, is product differentiation. Um, we know from our field work, also these modeling results, that actual product performance is currently not well matched with current ratings. And also for this application, um, with cheap natural gas backup, there don't appear to be very strong benefits of performance at cold climate conditions, um, which is associated with higher upfront cost. Although I will say the flexibility of those systems is hugely important and will be even more important as a future asset, but we need a way to show that value to customer customers and measure it for utilities today. Um, Additionally, our research found very positive market conditions. The market conditions are very ripe currently for transformational, transformational change with the right interventions. Um, we've shown customers are really open to more efficient equipment that makes economic sense, um, but their awareness of these options is critical. Uh, they need to know about these things before their AC fails. That's the bottom line. And they need to be given these options by their contractors during very short replacement windows. Um, contractors, distributors, and manufacturers, they all indicated that they see heat pumps are coming. They are open to adoption, but they need um, work towards resolving some of these initial barriers. Um, the supply chain wants to see more customer awareness and demand. Everyone is aligned here, um, and when they do, um, they will invest in supporting these machines in their business models. Um, that said, first costs have to be resolved for broad customer adoption. We're in a strange place uh, economically with costs on everything. Um, we haven't been here in a generation, but it's still incumbent on us to address these first cost barriers. Um, and we can address these first cost barriers. They can be solved through carefully crafted rebate structures, rates, movements like we've shown, and scale, increase sales to the supply chain. I think we've shown we're, we're very close to this now, um, and it's very achievable in the near term. And in this project, we've demonstrated there's many factors that impact overall savings and cost effectiveness. Uh, Renal highlighted these up front in our results. Um, air source heat pumps provide cooling savings over code minimum air conditioners. These savings can stack with those from improved fan efficiency and furnace efficiency, on, furnace efficiency under the right conditions. These combined efficiency benefits increase the net savings and bring down the cost, so to speak, of using air source heat pumps for um, space heating in other words, they buy some additional uh, positive climate impact from air source heat pumps used for space heating. Um, and these different savings details, as well as additional future operational flexi flexibility, should factor into customers making decisions about this technology. Um, lastly, I again have to reiterate that we do need to respect the extreme sensitivity to utility rates here, uh, current rates, as well as future rates. So um, where do we land? Uh, the bottom line is that I think our most remarkable finding is that air source heat pumps sized as cooling efficiency measures provide most of the um, electrification benefits of sort of the full air source heat pump electrification end goal. Uh, and they can do so at a lower cost while still retaining some co comfort benefits for customers. Entry level systems are at an approximate cost parity with baseline cooling systems. Uh, while variable speed systems bundled with new furnaces offer even more cost-effective savings. It literally can be the end of AC as we know it. Um, our, our market work showed many customers are willing to pay for energy cost savings, that they value comfort improvements, and that air source heat pumps can offer um, these things over baseline systems. Um, some of the incentives already out there make the customer whole right away, and that doesn't even consider what might be possible with the new eco framework. Uh, it doesn't include incentives for furnace or fan efficiency. And our work here shows that there are more than enough customers willing to make uh, big leaps today such that we could increase air source heat pump sales by orders of magnitude over where we are. Um, so this really does seem like a profound opportunity to advance uh, the baseline. Um, I'm not talking about updating code minimums, although that would be a great idea. Um, I think consistent with our findings uh, and all uh, of folks all along the supply chain, I'm suggesting that raising awareness among consumers and implementer is where we should put our resources. Um, we should put these resources into establishing the expectation that air source heat pumps in our climate um, to displace air conditioners, uh, to improve customer comfort, uh, provide customer savings, and give operational flexibility um, that we can lean on in the future and frankly might be necessary to meet future decarbonization goals. Um, 
these systems aren't perfect. We haven't resolved the details yet. There's some things to work out, but frankly, we have a lot of time to, for that remaining optimization. Um, but we are at the point where we need these systems installed during current replacement opportunities if we are serious about meeting future targets. Uh, these are 15 to 20 year decisions. Um, frankly, future targets can't be met if the equipment doesn't get installed at the next opportunity. And so the fact that we can get it installed and it looks like we can do it with savings and benefits or within a few hundred dollars of such over the lifetime of the equipment um, seems to me like a very easy choice and a really uh, compelling opportunity to push the status quo. Uh, thank you. Great, great. Thanks for that great presentation from you all. Um, really, really interesting and good. Um, if you have not already done so, please type any additional questions you have into the Q&A panel and send them to us. Adam, do you have any questions for anyone on the project team? Thanks, Mary Sue. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, already have a lot of good questions coming in. Um, so I'll just kind of go through them in order. Um, one question was, why is a ducted system recommended for baseboard heat? In most cases, wouldn't that require installation of a full duct system? Josh, I can I can take that one. Um, I looked back at that slide and there was a slide error. It should have said ductless systems paired with baseboard heat, so we can make that correction before sending the slides out. Great, thank you. Um, another question was, why are mini splits excluded as the impact would be great as retrofits in new construction? I'll answer that. I, I, I agree with those sentiments exactly. Um, we did that at the outset of the project just to limit the scope. Um, we went basically after the biggest market, realizing that heat pump applications are very complicated and diverse. We wanted to focus on the most consistent um, application and opportunity we see today, which is forced air configurations with natural gas backup. Sounds good. Let's see. The Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute's HSPF ratings usually are for Region 4. How can we translate that to an HSPF for Minnesota climate? That is a terrific question. I believe it is the subject of ongoing work to try to establish those methods, how we can get realistic uh, performance, um, single performance parameters um, across different climate regions. I think regardless of where those methods end up, the, the bottom line is they will need uh, performance metrics that are specific to different climates. Um, and I think this is one of the issues right now is without that, it's very hard to tell from these specifications how well this equipment works for specific applications such as um, the one we've shown here for Minnesota homes. Um, did you do any analysis of the cooling efficiency of air source heat pumps across high outdoor temperatures? Um, our modeling does take into account the variations in cooling performance across um, uh, the range of cooling temperatures. Okay. So I could see. extrapolate a little bit on that. I guess, yeah, all of our systems do lose performance at high outside air temperatures. Thanks. One, another question was about rebates. Um, the Minnesota power and otter tail power rebates must be for electric to electric changes. And the person was just wondering if that's correct. I can speak to that a little bit. Sorry for the poor audio. Um, the rebates from, from our understanding, the rebates are intended to focus on air source heat pumps as heating products. So their customers with gas and propane furnaces are eligible for them as well. It's not necessarily just to replace an AC. Great, thank you. Another question said, uh, slides 33 and 35 are very interesting given cost fluctuations. With a hybrid system, seems that there could be operating characteristics that would be dictated by gas prices because they will fluctuate more than electric rates. 
this is a new concept to me. Is this a quote unquote thing? Somehow automatically operating hybrid system in the winter based on month to month changes in gas costs. Um, yes, it is a thing. Theoretically, um, systems could be responsive to real time price, electric and gas prices and make operational decisions based on that. I actually think it was trained, maybe trained Mitsubishi working together five or seven years ago who are demonstrating a thermostat that basically did this. Um, and it, it seems well within the realm of potential for current thermostats who are internet connected and can make real-time decisions. That said, I don't know that it's a thing in practice yet. And I think there are probably some barriers to implementing it. Um, I think part of the issue is when you actually acquire the knowledge of what the gas price is um, and how, because that has to do with, you know, the real real-time prices, but then also how utilities are going to deal with that on a, on an hourly basis, um, which isn't exactly clear. So I think the opportunity there might exist, but it's probably not as, um, probably does not have the amount of potential that we could like think about in our heads as a sort of real time thing that would be constantly optimizing for lowest, lowest costs. Sounds good. You might've uh, already kind of addressed this question when you were going up over your last uh, section, Josh, but uh, I guess just as a reminder, um, what COP at what temperatures are you using for your modeling of um, air source heat pumps and cold climate air source heat pumps? Uh, we input um, COP curves as a function of temperature that we got from representative pieces of equipment. Um, so we don't use specific COPs. We'd have to, we could give you specific seasonal average COPs that we have, um, but they would vary for our many different scenarios. Um, I guess that's all I have to say about that. Renal might have some more detail about our, our modeling. Uh, yeah, so just based on the performance curves themselves, not specifically in these scenarios, you can see them in that one uh, plot on the bottom left-hand side of slide 24, which you can refer to once the slides are released. Uh, but that basically just shows the COP profile versus outdoor air temperature for all four units here in heating mode. Great, thank you both. Um, now the question is, at one point you said the unit performance did not correlate well uh, to cost because of other variables in installation costs. Can you talk more about that? Um, I think one of the points we made was um, the installation cost didn't correlate to equipment size in our collected bids. Um, in other words, there's just a lot of variation in our bids that was more significant than any trend we might have uncovered with respect to the, the cost uh, to size. Um, I will also say um, that there, I don't know if we said this or not, but I think the question is true. Um, unit performance doesn't necessarily correlate to cost well. Um, and it's because there's really a complex optimization going on here. For, for example, in some systems, they are, you, it generally costs more to get more performance and capacity at lower temperatures. But depending on the economics, we may not actually realize those benefits if the economics dictate that we're only operating them at mild temperatures. So this is kind of complex interplay between the efficiency at any specific temperature, the relationship between that efficiency and the baseline equipment, as well as the costs to operate that equipment. And that's what our, our, our contour plots do show is these things do vary quite a bit. And that's that sensitivity we have to live with. And that's what separates thinking about um, air source heat pumps as cooling measures. Uh, it was what differentiates it from thinking about all electric heating measures where when those systems need to operate at very cold temperatures, there's a much stronger benefit of having that efficiency in those applications. So it's really pointing to the, the fact that the products should be differentiated according to the application they're going to be used for. Great, thank you. Wondering if there is a metric that captures the environmental cost benefit of these changeovers in addition to the financial cost benefit? 
Well, that's a really good question. I am sure there is a metric, but it is probably imperfect unless it encapsulates a lot of thinking and information. Um, I, this is something we struggle with right now. We generally correlate environmental benefits or emissions reductions with energy savings um, just due to the relationship between uh, energy consumption and generation. But that is not always true because we know that the, the grid, um, the emissions intensity of the grid does vary. And I think, so the answer is yes, but the way to simplify that and incorporate it into decision making, like a financial cost benefit, I think uh, would be difficult, uh, but something we could certainly strive for. Let's see, just looking at the time, maybe uh, just we'll ask a couple more of these questions that have come in. We've certainly got quite a few of them and want to get want to get to all of them, but um, might not have time to go through all of them live, but we can get everyone written responses after the webinar. Um, so another question was, with such strong sensitivity to utility rates, do you see potential benefits in Minnesota of time of use rates, real time rates, or otherwise grid responsive rates? Also another great question. <laughs> it feels like it has a very complicated answer. Um, I would say off the top of my head, I don't know. I think grid responsive rates seem to me like there would be the opportunity to optimize on costs, but for time of use um, or anything that's sort of fixed uh, in advance, I think it would be very difficult to realize additional benefits off that. Um, that said, I would officially say that we need to study those things to give those answers. Sounds good. So just kind of a um, concluding two-tiered um, question for you. Um, what would you say is the single most important takeaway from the results of this study? And what areas of further research do you think are needed? Well, for me, the most important takeaway, I think, and surprising finding was that installing these machines, air source heat pumps, as cooling measures gets us half of the way to our space heating goals. I mean, we can reach half of our decarbonization goals if we just start replacing uh, air source, our central air conditioners with even single speed air source heat pumps right now. To me, this is just striking. Um, getting that equipment out there is sort of the first step and we've shown that we can start at the halfway point, <laughs> which makes our meeting our goals uh, um, uh, a lot simpler, honestly. In terms of the research, I think, Really, it's just about market and probably the customer awareness. I think we've shown throughout this that there's a lot of customers out there that are willing to do this. Uh, they just need to be aware of it and they critically need to know about it when they are faced with these replacement decisions. And that there's enough, um, there's enough potential out there among that group that if we can get them the information they need, they're gonna be making these decisions and they'll really accelerate the market. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and this, um, the excellent questions that have come in um, and for all of your answers. I, I see that we're a minute away from 12, Mary Sue, so thought I'd kick it back to you. Sure. Great. Thanks again for your work. And um, if you have questions for follow up, please um, feel free to contact one of us. And as I've said before, the recording of this webinar will be available as well as a slide set on the department's website in a couple of weeks. Um, and um, this is the um, R&D webpage that we have. And there's a lot of information on here that also refer to card projects. Um, you can get to it by the um, link at the bottom of this slide. And then thanks again for participating. Uh, before we leave, I just want to mention two upcoming webinars on August 18th. Um, Substream will explore using the lens and framework of SIP to understand energy issues related to food sovereignty and resilience in indigenous communities in Minnesota. And then on October 12th, Michael's Energy will discuss their investigation <clears throat> of the energy savings associated with the use of nanofluids as a heat transfer fluid in different HVAC applications. You can keep abreast of upcoming card webinars as they are scheduled and other news related to SIP by signing up for our email list. There's a link on this slide. 
In the meantime, feel free to contact me if you have questions about the CARD program. And finally, as a reminder here, there'll be a short evaluation that launches after this webinar. Please take a few minutes to fill it out and let us know how we did. Thanks again and have a good rest of your day.